The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, episode 783, for Monday, October 7th, 2019. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, and all the other stuff that's come up, and we mix them all together, mash them all up, formulate them into some kind of agenda, with the goal being each and every one of us learning at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors include Eero.com slash MGG, TextExpander.com slash podcast, Captera.com slash MGG and ExpressVPN.com slash MGG. We will talk about each and every one of those URLs a little bit deeper, a little bit later. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here, yet again, in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Yet again. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. Our our locations uh, stay the same, and yet <laughs> uh, the topics always change. So I like it. It's good. Hey, um, we have a lot to go through today. We oftentimes will record this show on Sundays. My schedule this week was such that we just couldn't. And it turns out that was a good thing because we're able to record our segment about installing Catalina and what happens and what to do after you've installed Catalina after Catalina has been released. So that was that happened a few hours before our recording. Uh, But we've got a lot of stuff to go through on that. We've got a few other things we'll talk about first. And then uh, and then we'll get there. The first thing that I want to mention, though, John, in iOS 13, uh, a little quick tip that you may not have noticed, especially if you have automatic app updates turned on. And that is if you go into App Store and you tap on your name or your icon in the upper right, you will see all of the pending updates as well as anything updated recently. Well, here's a cool thing. If you got an update or are about to get an update for an app that you realize, hey, I don't use that anymore. If you grab it and swipe to the left on the right, a little delete icon will appear and you can delete the app right from there. Super handy. I don't know why it took 12 extra iterations of iOS for us to be able to delete from the updates in the app store. But I mean, I know other things took priority. I do know why, but, you know, it's just how it goes. I am uh, very happy that we can now do this. You like that, Mr. Braun? So, yeah, so I see that you can do that. My question is, so if you say delete, does that, so then that'll never show up again until they release a newer No, version. no, no, that deletes oh. the app. Oh, it deletes the app. Entirely oh. from your phone. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Oh, that's not... Very intuitive. Okay. <laughs> huh. I mean, well, no, it's I mean, it's in the list of update notifications. So when you say delete to me, that doesn't yeah, necessarily fair. imply that you're deleting the update. Uh, you're deleting the app in its entirety. You know what I'm saying? I do. I, yeah. Now that you say it, I, I had never thought of it that way, but, but I get that. Yeah. It's the the same functionality works on the updated recently list, which are things that you just hit open by and and open instead of update. Uh, But the same delete option happens if you swipe to the left. So, yeah, but I I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. Right. Of course, the other thing that I've had more than one of my uh, uh, Twitter followers uh, shake their fist about is they've kind of hidden. So the thing is now you see your icon your user icon in the upper right hand corner but yes unless you tap on that it's not entirely clear that that's the new vehicle to get to updating your apps i don't know i i would kind of tend to agree it's like why did they bury it right yeah 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 for sure yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, once yeah, I, I once I, I noticed it, I'm like, oh, okay. Well, the app store is saying there's updates, and then you know, I I click on the icon. It's like, well, wait, something's different. Oh, I got to click on my user, and then I get to do my updates. It, well, they needed so. to leave room for Apple Arcade uh, to have its own icon at the bottom, so the updates icon got lost in the shuffle. 
I, I think that's what happens because I agree with you. That is also less than intuitive. So perhaps there was a hidden tip here, uh, even just getting to that delete option. So there you go. Nice little quick tip sandwich, which is good. <laughs> Speaking of quick tips, listener Chris says, uh, while I don't personally use emoji as a second language, it is occasionally a fun way to respond to a message as a sort of hieroglyphic one liner. Although browsing for an emoji seems to be better in iOS 13, I find myself relying on the emoticon text replacement feature when the need arises rather than scrubbing through the emoticon keyboard. And by the emoticon text replacement feature, what he means is typing in a word that you hope there is an emoji for, and then it shows it to you in the uh, suggestions box between the keyboard and the, and the screen there. Uh, he says, however, if you want to send a specific emoticon through text replacement, uh, one must know the specific text that corresponds to it. Correct. I discovered that if you type the emoji you are looking to send, so find the emoji, however you're going to find it, tap it once, select it, and then here's the trick. Choose speak from the cut, copy, paste pop-up. The text behind the image will be audibly revealed. While useful for some emoji, such as the microbe emoji, which is like the green little bug. I never knew it was called microbe. Uh, he says there's one, another one smiling face with sunglasses. He says it is a bit much to type for a specific emoji. Thankfully, iOS is smart enough to show emoji containing the word you are typing. So sunglasses will give you a few options. Thanks uh, for the great show. Chris says, yeah, I like that. That's good. That's great. I, I had no idea. I'm I still need to find a way to get siri to insert emojis into my replies that i dictate audibly i i've never dug into this because i only ever think about it while i'm in the car which is actually a bad time to to dig into these sorts of things as you might imagine you know driving and all but uh but i that's when i want to do it so i and of course now the second the that the this is the only other time i've thought about it while not in the car and of course now i'm podcasting so the good news is i'm hoping one of you might know the answer and if you do feedback at macgeekab.com would be a great place to send that i didn't hear that right dave i don't think because of these headphones i have which we're, we're gonna do something about that but i think you said feedback at macgeekab.com you're correct sir i said feedback at macgeekab.com at another tip for ios while we're at it tony jumps us to uh the new camera's and options in the iPhones 11. Uh, Tony says photos capture outside the frame is off by default, but it can be turned on in settings under camera. Uh, so you go to settings, go to camera and turn on or off photos capture outside the frame. Your photo can be edited after taking it and you can pinch in with crop to bring the ultra wide part of the picture. This doesn't work in low light, and apparently the extra data will be discarded after 30 days. Yeah, and, and you're right. He sent some pictures through, which, you know, the iPhone 11 cameras are great. Uh, but he says, uh, it, I, I dug into this a little bit. It is off by default because turning it on disables deep fusion, which is a tech that's coming in iOS 13.2. And... Uh, iOS 13.2 will and deep fusion rather is this it's the tech that Apple demoed that does the direct pixel um, analysis and enhancement of the uh, of photos that you take. So it, it essentially adds more detail and more sharpness than we can get with the current uh, calculations that happen. These pictures that we get on iPhone, I mean, we talk about how no filter and all of that. That's a great little hashtag to use. But the reality is the iPhone currently is and always has been doing a lot of math behind the scenes to make your pictures look good. You're not ever really seeing the raw thing, at least not in Apple's camera app. And you wouldn't want to like you would want to have this analysis done and, and this enhancement done. Uh, and Deep Fusion is a another layer of that. But turning this on will turning on the uh, c capture the photos outside the frame will turn off deep fusion and come iOS 13.2. You might not want to disable that. So have you messed with, uh, with any of these, John? Not really. I, I, I gotta say the, um, you know, kind of disappointed me 
because so I have a point and shoot like a, a super zoom yeah. camera. And when I was on our Chicago trip, there was a, a, an occasion to take a picture of monkeys <clears throat> and it was dark. But um, it was sad because when I used what I thought was a nice Nikon point and shoot, the pictures were terrible. But the pictures in low light with even the iPhone 8 on the older OS were outstanding. I mean, it, it, it just oh, amazes yeah. me with a tiny little lens. Um, but they have all the uh, but, but but they have all this processing power, as you pointed out, that uh, can really make your pictures look a lot better. So it's true. It's true. So I've run into that I, ever since. Uh, I think what was it the eight or the se- I think the seven is where they started to introduce image stabilization. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's when they started adding some of the smarts in. Yeah. Yeah. I I will uh I will say something John that will remain part of the inside baseball Mac Geek Hub lexicon <laughs> because we're not going to explain it. Uh but uh I will say we should all say thanks to the Griffin for uh for helping make that technology. <laughs> oh, I saw possible. your post. So, I'm just leaving that alone. I'm just leaving it alone. We're not going to explain why we say that, but thanks to the Griffin for making that technology possible. So, uh, really? all right. He did that. Awesome. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> so, all right. Moving on. Another Tony uh, has a different, uh, a different thing, and that is um, assistive touch can be used to uh, include series shortcuts which is super handy. So if you go into touch and turn on assistive touch, you can embed Siri shortcuts inside your assistive touch panel, which is pretty darn cool. So, you know, he's got one that says find Linda and it's right there in his assistive touch panel that pops up, which, uh, which is, you know, super handy. So yeah, that's in, uh, I think it's settings accessibility is that where assistive touches i usually have yeah settings accessibility touch and then you can turn on assistive touch uh and it will pop up a a more explicit way of using uh taps on the screen and all that good stuff so yeah fun fun hey all right uh let's see i will uh i want to take a minute john i want to talk about uh catalina that's my that's that's next on our list here but I want to talk about our first sponsors, which begins with Text Expander. Text Expander is one of my favorite apps for the Mac and for iOS because it makes my life so much easier. I'm an efficiency maniac and I'm a perfectionist. And normally those two things don't go well together because I want to get things done very, very quickly, but I don't want to get I don't want to make mistakes especially when I'm sending out like emails to customers and potential customers and all of that stuff. Well, text expander lets me be both quick and precise. And the reason I can be both quick and precise with text expander is because I take all of these things, the normal responses, things like replies to customer service inquiries or someone who's interested in perhaps buying a sponsorship on a show like this one. And I can perfect them and then store them In Text Expander, and when someone asks the same question, I can send them a response from Text Expander without having to proofread. I can do this in like 10 seconds, even from my iPhone, even from laying in bed, which you really shouldn't be like responding to emails laying in bed. But hey, that's how it goes. So you can do this, too. It's really, really powerful. It syncs amongst all your devices. It works so well. You've just got to try it out. So go to TextExpander.com slash podcast. Yes, that's the right URL. And that's where you're going to get 20% off your first year of Text Expander. And that's where also you can tell them that you heard about it on the show. But go check it out. Just go to TextExpander.com slash podcast. That's where you're going to want to be to find out and start living the life that we're able to live here because we have Text Expander. Our next sponsor is Eero. This is the mesh system the mesh Wi-Fi system that both John and I use in our homes. And they have been, they're one of the, they were one of the first 
And it shows, right? Because they've been able to learn and iterate and come out with new products and really, really stay at the top of the pack here because they just have a lot of experience with this. They're also really good at what they do. Having mesh in my home, you know, before we could buy something like Eero, we talked about it on the show. We created these quasi mesh scenarios that were crazy, but they worked, but they were crazy to manage. Well, with Eero, they work and they're not crazy to manage because you just get to do it all from your phone. In fact, your phone sees all of your Eero points throughout your house as one homogenous network together. And they all know about each other, which means they can help guide your devices. They can do all of the routing and they can make it so that not only are all your dead spots no longer dead, but they can make it so that you just have smooth, fast Wi-Fi throughout the home. And as we mentioned recently on the show, there's an all new Eero unit starting at just 99 bucks. So you can blanket your whole home in Wi-Fi for 99 bucks per unit or just I think 249 is what they're selling it for on their website so that you can get all of it. And here's the deal. You can get free overnight shipping and you can have yours as soon as tomorrow. Imagine that all your Wi-Fi problems fixed as soon as tomorrow. Go to Eero.com slash MGG. Enter code MGG at checkout to get free overnight shipping with your order. That's E-E-R-O dot com slash M-G-G. Code M-G-G at checkout to get your Eero delivered for free overnight shipping. You got to use the URL, Eero.com slash M-G-G, and you have to use the code M-G-G to get that offer. So make sure you do that. And our thanks to Eero for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, it's Catalina time, man. You ready? Catalina? Oh, are we going on vacation? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny. Are we I'm going actually, on a business trip? I'm going out to the West Coast for business. Yeah, but I'm not going to make it as far as Catalina. I'll be very close, as it turns out, for the second half of next week because I'm going to be at Mac Tech. Uh, and uh, and if you still haven't bought your tickets, actually, I have a link where you can, you can save a bunch of money. Mm. So uh, I will put mm. it in. Dave's special Mac Tech ticket link so i'll put that in the uh in the show notes but catalina i mean as you know of course apple's new operating system yeah catalina is gonna ruin everything for everybody well other than, <laughs> other than me it's been fine so uh you know no i'm just saying i i understand especially as a developer that you want to nudge people to 64 bit and uh well this is this is it yeah, it it's um it, I don't know that uh yeah, I mean the 64 bit thing, I, I think for most people it's probably not gonna be a problem. I mean, not only have the majority of apps updated, but we've been talking about this on the show for a while. So you're right. The first thing that you want to do is go run Mac Updater and make sure that you have up to date versions of all your apps and then Run Go64. We'll put links to both of these in the show notes. Go64 will go through and tell you if there's any non 64 bit stuff left. And lastly, uh, do a clone with Carbon Copy Cloner or Super Duper uh, because that way, you, if you need to roll back, you've got an easy way to do that. Uh, so once you've got that out of the way, I updated to Catalina, I updated my main machine. And so, well, my main laptop, which for the next 11 days is going to be my main machine while I'm on the road. Uh, I updated that to Catalina and, you know, things went pretty smoothly. Like I did it with the, the Golden Master. So I had to install the beta profile and all that. But it uh, but it worked. It was fine. John, you you actually had some problems with that. So I'm hoping that you don't have an issue updating your machine to the release of Catalina. But we'll uh, we'll see. So I had a nightmare. Uh, so if you're part of the developer program, you have to download this uh, beta access magical thing that all of a sudden makes your system preferences software update, see the betas. And right. Dave, I tried, man. And I did clones of drives because I'm not going to do it on my daily driver. Um, but I clone my drives and um, 
tried to run this and in one case it would never finish the download it was like eight gigs or something on another machine it said it downloaded it and then i restarted and it was like oh yeah you're running mojave i'm like dude you just apply so i don't know why i don't know if it's the vintage of my machines maybe um, it shouldn't be one's a 2012 mac mini uh, uh, i'm sorry so i have a 2012 macbook pro and a 2014 mac mini and i cloned those drives using carbon copy cloner before i applied the um beta update and yeah. i don't know yeah well hopefully it works for you when you do the uh the now that we have the, the release the, now that the so, release is out yeah and the gm as you, i think you told me the gm was a couple of versions behind well, release, I mean, it's, right? it's one notch behind. Yeah, the, the release build number was one one digit less than the one that that wound up being the release. So um, but I had no trouble. Well, certainly no trouble installing it. It worked flawlessly and even using it has been flawlessly, but or has worked flawlessly. But I did want to go through a few things just to prepare you all for any failure or uh, changes or differences. I don't think you're going to see failure to be perfectly honest. It's been pretty smooth, uh, but, uh, but you might, I mean, John experienced some, some failure there. So who knows? Um, the first thing I want to point you to after you get it installed and up to date is go into system preferences and into iCloud because you want to make sure you're logged into iCloud. My machine for whatever reason was not. And I, I relogged myself in and everything worked out fine. Like it was, it was a non issue. I thought, Oh no, like I got, uh, it's going to be some major deal. No, not at all. Um, there are two things, uh, in, uh, and of course now I'm opening up my laptop, which I have Catalina on so we can talk about it. I'm getting all kinds of notifications, which is great. Uh, You'll see the layout of system preferences is different. Your Apple, I, Apple ID is one option. So it's no longer an iCloud um, widget in system preferences or pref pane in system preferences. It is called Apple ID and it is at the top. Next to it is family sharing, at least for me. And I, my guess is for everyone. And if you have it turned on, then it will have more details in there. So I went into system preferences, Apple ID, and just had to log back in. And, and then things were fine. Um, it retained all of my uh, preferences in there. I don't I don't have mail turned on uh, in the list of apps on this Mac using iCloud. And it remained not on just as I had previously. I think I needed to click the iCloud keychain box to uh, to turn that back on for whatever reason. But it came back on and it was fine. Uh Every, everything, you know, it logged me and it was a non-issue, but just check that because it's not, it was not immediately obvious. Like there was nothing yelling at me about the, um, the Apple ID, uh, you know, not being logged in. So just, just make sure you check that. So any thoughts on that, John, before I, before I move down my list? Um, other than I ran into the same thing when I was attempting the upgrade at some point, it said, oh, I don't know who you are via iCloud. Could you hmm. please log in again? So interesting. Interesting. So my installation was, yeah, not right. entirely successful, but, uh, but I ran into that as well. Right. So, well, but you never got it installed, right? I'm talking post install. No, I was yes. logged out. No, I yeah. get it. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, one of the big differences that we know about is the music app because the music app was not in um, prior versions of the OS. We had iTunes and that has been broken out into several other apps. The podcast app is new. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and frankly works to me has worked way better than the podcast functionality in iTunes. It's not sluggish anymore. I open it. It works. That's great. The music app. I, so I use iTunes every day at my desk to play songs from my library. I have music going almost all the time when I'm at my desk, other than when I'm on the phone or, or whatever. Obviously, I'm not listening to music now while podcasting, uh, but getting work done. I, you know, I like music. It helps me focus and, and all that. So uh, the music app, I was really worried about what they had done to that and 
uh, and there is one major change, and that is in the in iTunes when you viewed your library, you could view anything in what they call as songs view. And the nice part about that was you could see like when you viewed songs in the library, you could get a listing at the top that let you break it down by artist and album. That is now gone. Those filters are no longer there. And, and to me, that's like a huge sadness, but fine. It's gone. We accept it. We move on, but just kind of wanted to warn everybody. If you use that little thing there, um, you used to be able to do that and now you can't, um, when you go to view a playlist, regardless of how you had it viewed in iTunes, it will be in the, um, as playlist view, which is maybe what you want. And it just shows the songs with the, their timestamps. I like to sort by album. I have a playlist that I sort of throw things into and I like to be able to sort in different ways. You can go to the view menu and choose view as songs and then it will sort by, you know, and then you can then you can see a multi column, a true multi column view, just like you had in iTunes. And you can go to view show view options and turn on whatever columns you want for that playlist. Uh, it works the same way that it did in iTunes, which actually this is something I don't think we've ever talked about on the show. Thankfully, it's not too late to talk about it, but I like to sort my uh, songs by album, by artist slash year. Now, that seems like a very specific way to do things, and it is. And if I have the album column there in uh in iTunes or now in the music app and I click it, it will let me sort by that column. And then if I click it again, it adds the artist to that column. And if I click it a third time, it adds the year to that column. And this is something that works, like I said, both in iTunes and in music. I've never seen it documented anywhere, but I love it because I can sort by band and then by year, which for a crazy music person is exactly what I want. I want it alphabetical by band name chronological by band and it lets me do that so uh i've been I, I actually have been very happy with the music app it's again far less sluggish than itunes had gotten for me uh and other than losing that way to filter the songs view really there isn't anything else that in my use case you know wound up sort of jarring me so figured i'd share that any any questions about that before i move on to mail john not really questions, but I'll, I'll throw something into the ring here is that so. My music. So I, I was kind of surprised that you use iTunes for your music. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing is, I'm set up, as you know, but if you don't and I'm going to tell everybody about this. But uh, so the thing is, I actually have copied my iTunes library to my Synology. And then I use I think they call it audio station which presents it as a DLNA audio source. And then I have a Denon Heos, which offers the thing that you mentioned, Dave, that I think is very valuable is that you can sort by album slash artist. So it's a speaker system that has software. It's hardware and software, but they've been improving their software. I'm actually still pretty happy with it and actually prefer it playing my music versus uh, iTunes because yeah. the, the, one, the DLNA integration and number two, that it offers a, a pretty rich set of uh, sorting options that um, like you, I find it very handy to sort by artist and album. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, I don't know why Apple pulled that, but Hey, so any, um, I, I, I'm trying to keep us on track here with, with Catalina yes. for this segment. That's all. Okay. No, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll get, so get back in your lane. Any, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any questions about the music app in Catalina? I just want to give folks something to focus on here. That's all. That's my no, idea. no. Yeah, it's okay. a, it's okay. good that they broke it out. It's yeah. sad that they pulled a feature that you like, but you know. Yeah, but that happens, right? It had to so be done. That one is not nearly as big of an issue as the next one I'm going to tell you about, John. And that is in mail. You and I, I think you and I, but certainly me, I have been a huge fan of what they called classic mode uh, in mail. 
And you could invoke that by going into mail preferences, view options, I think, or maybe it's just viewing. And there used to be a checkbox to turn on classic mode. That is now gone. However, all is not <sighs> entirely lost. What classic mode was or and 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 what this new mode that they have sort of is, is having a list of your mailboxes down one side of the screen and then uh in the uh, in the sort of main viewer window that would be split horizontally with the message list at the top and then the messages themselves, the content of the selected message at the bottom. That's classic mode. So uh, that's gone in its place is an option that came up by default for me in the view menu. And it is use column layout. If you don't do that, mail looks similar uh, you, you get that same three pane view if you if you want it, but the message list at the top of that screen is showing like the person and subject in a in a in a not columned layout. It's a it's a just a, a um, sort of sort of like iOS shows you the the preview layout is probably the best way to say that. So that's fine. However. Column layout isn't really multi column layout. Sure, it displays data from multiple sources, including whether it's read or unread. So that's one column and you can have the bullet to show you that it's read or not flagged. That's another. Well, that's another uh, thing that is sorted or not sorted. That is another thing that is displayed. It all looks like a column layout. This is why I'm having trouble saying this. Um, so you have you have read or unread flagged attachments, the from name, the subject and the time. And you can choose to sort by most of those. Here's the problem. I cannot set how wide the columns are because it's not actually columns. It is one column with all of that data spaced out to look like it's in multiple columns. So in a sense, it's a it's an active screenshot of what a multi-column view would look like. But you can change what the screenshot has in it by by, you know, changing what it's sorted by. And you can choose like I can choose to sort by date with newest messages on top or oldest. I mean, it, it's got that that level of granularity is there. But if I want to change the width of those columns, no, not going to happen. Like now I can't see what time yesterday a message came in. Because the width of that portion of this one column is only wide enough to show either the time or the word yesterday. So I can't see that it came in at yesterday at 4 p.m. I just see yesterday. This is no bueno. This, I mean, this has actually really been a, a shock to the system here because I'm so I spend so much time in mail that um I, you know, I'd really gotten like I really find functionality in being able to see more about specifically the time of when a message came in. Will I adapt? Of course, I really don't have any choice, <laughs> but, but I'm not happy about it. So a fish shake there. So just so you know, that's I'm, I'm sure you're going to notice this, too, John. Um, Yeah. So what you're saying. So the thing is right now in mail on my non updated machines. Yep. Excuse me. If you right click on the uh, where all the columns are, you'll see various categories, attachments, author. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what you're saying is that they've reduced or, or changed the way that some of the selections work. Because like you I don't have, get to see you don't get to choose which columns you have um, because there's only so they've one. gotten rid of that. So you, you cannot choose which columns you want anymore. Those are the words I just said, unfortunately. Mm, okay. No, yep. I just wanted to make no, sure. No, no, it's you're, you're <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. And you cannot change the width of the, you know, and I'm using uh. air quotes here for columns because they aren't columns. So therefore you can't adjust widths. It's one okay. column with these fields laid out in relation to each other for each message. Yeah, it it's wow. I'm yeah. not sure who thought that was a good idea. <laughs> I, 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 well, I mean, <laughs> let's let's face it. It was called classic view for a reason, right? They came up with this new view, what several OSs ago, 
and right. left classic view around. But but the two were were operated very differently. If you if you turned on classic view, things just changed dramatically uh, in mail. And similarly, if you switched back to not classic view. So this new column view is not all that different from the view that you get if you're not in column view. It's just what what is contained in the cell is different, if that makes sense. But it's still just one column. It's just what's the layout of each cell in the column. And now that's what you get. So, right. Yeah, it's I mean, it, it is what it is. Right. But just FYI, you're going to notice this. Sorry. Here's a good thing. Sidecar is awesome. And with 11 days on the road ahead of me here, starting later this week, uh, I got to speak at Google at the end of this week and then Mac Tech, as I said. So I'm, I'm on the road having the second screen of my iPad that works. I tried Duet in the past and I don't know, man, maybe it was just me or I don't know, but it was always sort of janky. I could get it to work and then it would fail. It it was unreliable for enough such that I Never used it. Um, I did not rely on it uh, while on the road. With my experience, I had sidecar up yesterday while I was pre- preparing some slides for one of these presentations, and it was just flawless. I mean, it was it was it worked great, and it's super okay. easy. Sidecar being the technology ah. that Apple introduced that extends your Mac screen to an iDevice is did I get that right? You're, yeah, thank you. Yep, just to <laughs> to an iPhone to an iPad. I don't think it works with oh, an just iPhone. Oh, just an iPad. Okay. Yeah, it wouldn't make much sense on an I, iPhone. I don't think so. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, maybe maybe the larger iPhones. I don't know, but I think it's iPad. Um and it's actually pretty cool. Um uh, you set it up inside system preferences. Uh there is a new sidecar uh preference pane there. And you go into sidecar and configure it. And I'll talk about some of the configuration options in a minute. And then once you've sort of turned it on and the display is up, then you go to system preferences displays and you configure it there like you would any other secondary monitor. So if you want it on your right hand side versus the left hand side, you use the arrangements tab. I mean, it's it's exactly like any other secondary monitor. It's just not wired and it's working with, you know, sidecar magic. Now, a couple of cool things. One is that if you have a Mac that does not have a touch bar, you can add the touch bar to your sidecar device, which is cool. Uh, I've been, you know, still experimenting with this MacBook pro. I've come to like the touch bar, as I mentioned recently. So, it's nice to have that option. I have it turned off for now because I have a real touch bar. But if I if and when I go back to not having a real touch bar, I will almost certainly turn it back on. And I'm currently using my iPad with a bridge keyboard, the B-R-Y-D-G-E uh, keyboards, which are awesome. And that keyboard works fine in sidecar mode. So I can type on that keyboard And it types into, you know, whatever window on my Mac is right there. Uh, So it it and it works really, really well. Like I didn't even think I in fact, I was using it going back and forth. And I was like, wait a minute. Like, why is this work? So. um, So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That it's good. It's super smooth. It's it's not like, like I said, I'd used Duet. It was janky. It was. Uh, you know, weird and wonky. This, I, I have yet to have any like interruptions or sluggishness or, you know, any of those weird things that you might expect with a wireless monitor, essentially. So, so that's sidecar. Um, Apple arcade is now available in, uh, in Mac OS Catalina to everyone, which I am stoked about because for five bucks a month, the whole family gets Apple Arcade on all of our devices. And now our Catalina Macs are included in that, which is kind of cool. Have you messed with Apple Arcade yet, John? On your iPhone, I mean, not on your Mac, because you have you need Catalina for that. No. OK, but I hear rave reviews. So that's it's fun. I mean, it, you know, it depends ahead. on the game. Yeah. But they, you know, it, it it's it's kind of a nice thing the way they've built these things. It's it's nice to have games that can that are truly just written to be games and not 
profit centers trying to eke out, you know, extra dollars to buy coins and things like that. It's it, I like that part of this is a big win. Uh, and the, the games can just be oh, kind of fun. Okay. So, like yeah. uh, Pokemon Go, which I and uh, I, I believe a lot of our listeners uh, play as well. But yeah, um, if you want to get ahead in the game, right. yeah, you got to throw down some coin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you don't uh, have to, but but it makes it <laughs> right. It accelerates the process of you getting to higher levels and, right. and all that stuff. So uh, that's cool. No. Yeah, it's it's cool. Um the other thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump us to a cool stuff found here, is that the TripIt app for Mac came out today. And the reason it was today that it came out is because it's a catalyst app, or as Apple calls it, a project catalyst app, meaning that the TripIt engineers took their iOS uh, app code base and spent some time and tweaked it and modified it to make it so that it has a nice Mac user interface and they're good to go. And I've run it and it works and it's available in the Mac app store for free. So you, if you are a TripIt customer and I can't imagine doing any amount of travel without using TripIt because it just manages all of my stuff for me in a mostly automated way. It's fantastic. Uh, now you can manage your plans on the Mac using the app and this like I'm really excited. Not, I mean, having a trip it up on the Mac, I never really had any trouble managing on the web. So that that's fine. But I am really stoked about the possibilities with project catalyst because, you know, take for example, Twitter, right? Twitter apps, any third party Twitter app is, is like crippled because Twitter doesn't allow third parties to have the same access to their notifications and things like that, that Twitter's native app does. But Twitter doesn't have a native app for the Mac yet, unless it's come out this afternoon since we started recording. But they will, as they said, and it'll be based on their iOS code base. And the Twitter for iOS app is absolutely the best Twitter app I've found because it's not crippled. Doesn't matter if you like the user interface better. It's just a better app because it has the right features. So I'm stoked about Twitter for Mac coming around. Like, again, it shouldn't be that way. They should open up their API, if you ask me, but they're not going to. So this is, uh, you know, this this door opens and I'm, I'm pretty stoked about this whole Project Catalyst thing. I think it'll I think it means a whole lot of good stuff for us Mac users, which which is the key. So any other questions of personally, uh, I'm a Twitterific fan. Yeah, I know. But it's, yeah, I got, but it I got tired of I got tired of Apple's or Twitter's lackluster support for going between platforms or between devices. And no, Twitterific, I think, does the best job that they can of offering features that people need. Yeah, but if you uh, use within the, the limitations of the Twitter use universe, the Twitter which, app on iPhone and iPad, you you get all of that. Right. Like and so once Twitter has a Mac. App, right. I, I, yeah. And I run it. Yes, I run both on, on my iPhone. And yeah. So like notifications, mm -hmm. for example, you know, like, you know, just today it was like, hey, Dave Hamilton, you know, posted, you know, like a, a really cool message. And that's coming from Twitter, not from Twitterific. Right. Right. Because they can't access that you know whole stream of data. But, Which is um, ridiculous. But again, just how it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. So, yeah, I'm stoked about uh, Catalina. I am comfortable, especially now that it's actually been released. I'm even more comfortable running it on my, uh, you know, what will be my daily driver laptop. But but even after, you know, running it for the last whatever, four days or something, five days, it's been it's been fine. Like um, I wasn't worried um, It is as we pointed out earlier, if you were on the beta track or are on the beta track, the release version is one notch different of Catalina. So you might just want to go to the Mac app store, download Catalina there and install it so that it will upgrade you to the latest. So there you go. Now you being the audio guy, I'm yeah. curious. So you have it on your, you don't have it on the machine you're using right now to do the podcast, right? I, I don't No. I don't, but I have and tested. I'm sensing you're not in a rush to do that because major OS upgrades typically break audio things, right? So they haven't. You are you are not wrong. 
Um, and I have always hesitated to update this machine for primarily for that reason. But the last few updates really haven't broken that. It really was the transition to core audio that was the issue. And and the first few OS updates after we had sort of, you know, gotten onto that core audio platform were very there were a lot of just a lot of fundamental changes. That's not so much the case anymore. It's a pretty stable thing. I um after I updated the laptop, you know, it was like, I don't know, Saturday night or something. And I had this moment of panic, like, oh, crap, I'm going to need to record podcasts on the road. Is Audio Hijack, the app that I use, like as the core of my recording scenario, is that Catalina ready? And the answer is officially at that point in time. No, this afternoon, an update came out that that begins to offer what they call preliminary Catalina um, compatibility, but I tested it on Saturday night with a version that said it would not run in Catalina or was not certified for Catalina and it ran fine. Now, would it have run fine for two hours? I don't know. You know, maybe probably, um, it doesn't seem like a whole lot has changed in that regard, but, but I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm happy now that that update came out. It's like, okay, good. So I'll be good whenever the the recording. Has okay. To happen. So it looks so. like the audio subsystem has not changed dramatically. I don't think so, but don't hold me to that. I might, I could be very wrong. Of course, you know, it, it wouldn't be the first time. So, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, any, any other questions? I want to get to some of these other tips. Uh, I want to talk about our other sponsors, but I want to wrap up uh, Catalina first here just to, you know, just to get us in the, in the right, um, in the right zone. I guess the only thing is that since I never got to experience the joy, uh, although I tried to <laughs> not for a lack and of applying trying. it, yeah. but uh, I'm, I'm curious, what, what was the first thing that struck you as like, wow, this is different or this is better. And maybe you've covered that already, but um, that's a good and, question. Uh, um, you know, honestly, the speed of the music app uh, was a, a welcome change. So so there definitely is, is that. OK, so they yeah. broke that out and they yeah. optimized it, it sounds like. So that's yeah. that's good. But now yeah. today, like I wasn't able to run any Project Catalyst apps over the weekend because there was nothing in the app store, at least nothing that I knew to find. Those started appearing today. And so that that really, like I said, that excites me just for the, the possibility Um Okay, but was there anything that you couldn't do? Was there anything that upset you or just you're like, we're shaking your fists like, wait, I was able to do this on the prior OS. Now I can't anymore. Now- Malware bytes wouldn't run. Um, okay, so they have not yet properly updated for. Yeah, and it's not a 64 bit thing with them. It's just a whatever they're doing is, you know, not <laughs> right. I, like it, it, it will not run. And I downloaded a new installer and it would not install. Like it was like, no, no, this is not going to happen, man. Like, OK, <laughs> got it. OK, so uh, at, at least at, at, as of the last time I checked, they had not yet updated it. I assume they're on it. They've got a forum post about it and all that. So I, I will, you know, I'll assume they're going to make it happen. But um, but yeah, that was. I think that was the only thing, though, that didn't run like all my I was worried about things like Synology Drive, um, you you know, the stuff that I sort of rely on that that lives behind the scenes that I don't think about, but is super critical for me. Um, I use Small Cubes Mail Suite with their plugin SigPro and Mail Acton, and their beta came out on Friday, which which is good because I can't live without that. And it's it's buggier than I would like it to be, but it's mostly functional. So uh, that, that has been, if, if there's, and there, you know, if there's a a thing that's, that's still sort of janky, it's definitely that in my world. So, okay. The one thing I saw, and I don't know if you still run a Drobo, but um, no. Okay. I mean, I do, but only one of their components. So if you go to activity monitor, uh, yeah. you can see the biddiness of things. And the only process that was running on my machine, I think it was called DD server or DD something, but that was the only process that was 32 bit. So I don't know if 
my Drobo or the Drobo dashboard. Well, I'll, I'll see if they came out with a new version. Yeah, you'd still be able to that, connect over like SMB or AFP. Like you could still connect in the finder to get the data on your Drobo, but you might not be able to run the management software. That's true. Yeah. Right. That's the only thing I noticed. So, so again, folks, you know, look at your, you know, run activity monitor or go 64 would tell you the same thing. I think um, I would assume. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. so sounds like a good upgrade so it, far. So far. Yeah. It, I, I will point out one thing. It really, I mean, we don't have enough experience with it to say whether it's good or bad. I think it's really good, uh, but time will tell is that in, uh, you know, your drive or my drive. And once you upgrade your drive too, will now be split into two volumes. You'll have a system volume and a data volume. Mac OS does a very good job of, obscuring this from you and not making you worry about it. But your operating system is living on a separate APFS volume from your data files and your applications and things like that. And it's because that way they can make the operating system volume read only. And it really eliminates a lot of the holes, the security holes that, uh, that could potentially have existed. It does change some things. Like I was worried I really like Intel power gadget because I like to see what, you know, where my CPU is running and all that stuff. Um, they updated Intel power gadget, the plugin or the extension for it works in Catalina. It's fine. All good. So, uh, so, you know, it, it's fine. It, it's, it's not an issue for me, but I, we, I'm sure it will mean that troubleshooting disc problems is different. I'm hoping that by different, I mean, way less frequent and better but you know we'll find out so but you you'll only see it if you go into disk utility you won't see this if you're just browsing around in the finder they they the finder ta does a very good job of of sort of merging these into one visible volume for lack of a better term so okay yeah and if we haven't mentioned it already dave for goodness sake before you apply a major os update make a backup no make a clone i'm going to say not a time machine but i'm going to say a clone with either ccc or super duper because time machine is is all right and you can certainly when you install a new os you can certainly suck down the time machine your most recent time machine backup but just because it's not bootable makes me uncomfortable so um so, so just one listener, actually not one listener, many listeners in response to a topic we said we we discussed in one episode recently pointed out that time machine is bootable if you're doing it on a local like a direct attached drive. Now, it doesn't mean that it's bootable like a clone. You can't boot and start running, but you can boot and access your data and, you know, restore and do all of that stuff there. So it it is somewhat functional in that way. OK, no, but, you're right. I, I But yeah, I still agree with your article. advice. Yeah. But they have a support article that I think says that is like, yeah, if you if you do the magic hand wave, you can, in fact, make it bootable yes but it's it's not entirely clear how to do that I, That's I was surprised when we got that tip so yeah yeah same i yeah yeah I, i've been i hadn't been doing direct attached time machine backups for a very long time i'd been doing them across the network so um i, I missed it which is great that's i mean that's why we love doing this show but there might be some apps that you need to uh, replace when you get Catalina. And that's why our next sponsor, Captera at captera.com slash MGG is super, super valuable because Captera is where you can go to look at over a million reviews of different products from real software users so that you can discover the app that you need. And you don't have to filter through blindly because not only do they have over a million reviews, they've got over 700 specific categories of software. So especially those, you know, business apps, sometimes they don't get updated all that often. And, you know, you can live with it. It's fine until Catalina comes along and you can't. Well, that's what you need Captera for. You just go to captera.com slash MGG. 
And they're going to be your leading free online resource. Oh, yeah. Did I mention Captera is free? You get to review the reviews of over a million people, right? It's amazing. It's crazy. 700 categories of software, a million reviews or more. And you get to find the apps that you're looking for. You've got to check it out. And like I said, it's free. Go to captera.com slash MGG for free today and make an informed software decision for your business and find the software that's going to work for you. Our thanks to Captera for sponsoring this episode. Express VPN, folks. This has become my favorite VPN to use. And you know that with, you know, more than a week of travel coming up ahead of me, that I've got ExpressVPN dialed in on all of my devices so that I can make sure my data is secure without slowing me down. ExpressVPN is super easy to install. It just works. It doesn't use up a ton of CPU or anything. And it makes it so that even if I'm in like a coffee shop or an airport or some wherever I happen to be, and they haven't updated their router. And so there's like some crack flaw still living in their thing. It doesn't matter because I've got Express VPN and Express VPN has got me. It's awesome. You can check this out, right? Go to expressvpn.com slash MGG. Not only does that get you the best in online security and privacy protection, it also that special link expressvpn.com slash MGG gets you three extra months for free with your one year package. So you can protect your internet today with the VPN that I use all the time to keep my data safe. Go to expressvpn.com slash MGG to get started. And of course, our thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode. You want to take us to Dimitri, John? Yes, Dimitri. Thank you very much. So uh, we helped Dimitri out, or I did. Uh, I think, but here we go. So he's giving us some feedback or a follow-up from a, a prior episode. And he says feedback that hopefully can be useful. You recommended two tools to recover data from badly failing external rotational drives that won't mount, namely the free tool DD rescue and the pay tool data rescue five by ProSoft. I went ahead with DD rescue it took quite some fiddling to get it up and running and the recovery process started and was into several hours with tiny progress and forecasted to run over several days. Ooh, that's a long time. At this point, well, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, I guess that's bringing, true. Bringing yeah. data back from the dead, you know, takes time. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah. At this point, I decided to look at the trial of Data Rescue. There is one huge difference. DD Rescue won't give me any view of the directory of the failing drive. Data Rescue recovered and showed me the drive directory, which allowed me to select only folders with photos which uh, apparently he has a uh, 14, uh, 12 year <laughs> photo library. So, um, so that oh, was nice. Yeah. I may have recovered a couple of photos to test. And then I went and paid the 120, which I guess that that's with tax. I, I looked at their site and I think it's 99 bucks, which, uh, and I think you get five licenses or five devices, which, uh, Hey, if it saves your, your bacon, that that's cool. Um, but then he did a total of a couple of weeks to painstakingly recover folder by folder. But he broke the process down into chunks of time. So apparently there's a level of granularity that you can do with a DD rescue. And that I was able to leave my computer to safely run the next recovery session. After two weeks, 400 gigabytes of recovered photos was so worth the money. So just thought we'd share that success story. So, uh, my only comment was, uh, well, I had two comments. So one, um, there is a GUI for DD Rescue. I don't know if he uh, uh -huh. did that. And actually, I think we have a, um, so DD Rescue, you can run from the command line. Right. And using something, uh, your, your favorite package manager, whether it be, um, uh, what do you use? What do I, I use? I, oh, I use Homebrew for my packages. Okay. And then, oh, okay. Yeah. So Homebrew is cool. And then there's something called Cake. 
I think uh, uh, well, cake, cake. cake brew is a gooey front end for home. Brew. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. So so we're going to go in the tunnel here and talk about gooeys for things that otherwise don't have gooeys. Right. But um, graphical inter- graphical user interface for those of you that that don't know. Oh, the, wow. The terminology. Boy, you're going back. Yeah. But um, right. but anyways, there is a gooey for uh, uh, that may make DD Rescue more approachable. Uh, and we did an article about that. And of course, Data Rescue from our, our pals at uh, ProSoft, which actually um, I just saw an alert come up, <laughs> several alerts saying, hey, we got new versions of our software because oh, that's good. there's Catalina, right? That's great. Well, I guess news. they upgraded, though I had, we haven't, yeah, we'll, ha- we'll have to talk to them, but I guess they upgraded uh, Drive Genius and, uh, uh, and some other things. That's great. Right? Yeah. No, I, I got a thing about, that. I think Drive Genius 6, I think, is, is out now. And then, Outstanding. That's good. So we'll they took a while to get updated, I think, for Mojave or something, right? I mean, they, they were a little slow right. on that one. So that's good. Oh, that's great to hear. Good. Coolio. Right. So, um, so yeah, so the free tools are, you know, they're worth what you pay for them. But um, right. well, <laughs> having a GUI on top of- is a lot. I mean, well, <laughs> they're sometimes worth a lot, even though you don't have to pay. But- you you might wind up paying in, say, time or frustration to get the functionality out of them that they can deliver. So, yeah. Right. And I got to say that I'm fascinated, especially data rescue. I, I know a bit about how they do what they do. But yeah. Uh, so if your directory is destroyed, which it sounds like that's what happened in this case, how would you even figure out? And the thing is that they, they do some really smart stuff to try to figure out, well, hey, is this a picture or is this a this or that? And. Yeah. Well, apparently for Dimitri, it, it, it worked out. So um, hats off to uh, ProSoft and Data Rescue for getting your data back. Coolio. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dimitri. That's great. Um, all right. We talked, I talked in the last, we talked in the last episode about the new MacBook Pro, which I mentioned here, the, the low end MacBook Pro. And I promised that I would circle back around to RAM and then we didn't. So I wanted to circle back around to that, but... We were talking about the two hundred dollar delta between the um, between the the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro. And Gillies wrote in and says a small comment about that. I believe your assessment about CPU and GPU. Uh, he says one thing that you didn't mention is the two. You could use the two hundred dollars on RAM. Over the years of use, I think sixteen gigs will most likely be a better investment in the air. So I, 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 I get that. And I, I was going to bring that up to you as well and I'll let you finish and then I'll give you my fish shake. Okay. Well, (laughs) I, you know, I, I, when I bought my MacBook air last December, I ordered mine and Lucas's with 16 gigs of Ram because I Ram, I felt, and I think I'm correct about this was the reason that my 2011 air couldn't have another e- year or two eked out of it, right? Um, it it really was, you know, that I was just running against RAM limits all the time. Uh, but I think eight is enough because this uh, this, and I don't just mean to invoke the the name of the, the old TV 70, show, seventy sitcom. <laughs> yeah, uh, awesome. but but eight, they were right, right? Like the, those people in the seventies knew stuff, man, and they what they knew was that eight is enough, and. Eight gigs really is enough on like because this this laptop that Apple sent me has eight gigs of RAM in it. They apologized for that when they sent it. And I said, actually, no, that's good. I need to know whether, you know, how I feel about this. I've taken this thing on some trips with me. I am going to do it again. I have no hesitation about that because of the, you know, eight gigs of RAM. In fact, I see zero performance like it, it. I am not running into problems. Mac OS, we've said it on the show before, but now I can say it based on personal experience. Mac OS is very much geared to run extremely well with eight gigs of RAM. The only reason you'd need more is if you were doing something where you really were pushing those RAM limits on in a specific app like Let's say you were editing lots of video or something. You probably wouldn't be doing that, though, with something that's, you know, a sub fifteen hundred dollar laptop. So I, I, I really feel like for anyone that's considering this machine and I, I count myself in this group. Right. I know I'm a geek. This is not my main machine, but it is my main machine when I'm on the road. And I think eight gigs is is enough. I really don't think about it. So I know this bothers you fundamentally, John, but. 
You're going to have to trust me on this. Um, I'm just going to look at the numbers and just tell you what I see here. So okay. the thing is, my MacBook Pro has 16 gigs because you can upgrade it to that. Sure. And I'm looking here and I see that the memory pressure is at 13% and there is no swap occurring. Now, if I look at my mini, which is not my daily driver, but when I ordered it, I got it with eight gigs and it shows memory pressure at 32% and it shows some swap. So, but to your point, I haven't noticed a huge performance. Right. Right. Well, swap thing. is all so happening. I'm, on so a, I'm, I'm on the fence. Uh, if, if when I order my next MacBook Pro, I'm going to get 16 gigs. I get that. I, Although I, I trust your judgment. The yep. thing is, especially since you can't upgrade the RAM yourself anymore, the thing is, you probably want to err on the side of getting more RAM than less RAM. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I no. You know what? I don't. I don't fault that logic. I, I. I don't think it's necessary, but I also Mm -hmm. can't know the future. Right. I can only predict. Um, And and if you're willing to spend an extra 200 bucks just to have that peace of mind, by by, by all means, then do that. If that makes you feel better, do it. I I truly don't think you're going to need it. I think you'd be better off banking that money and then just replacing your laptop a year or two sooner Mm -hmm. And getting all the new capabilities instead of just like using RAM to to, you know, get blood from a stone kind of thing and and eke that along a little bit further. Yeah, right. No, it's just that we're in the age now where at least with Apple stuff, your RAM choice is your RAM choice. You can't change it. But if all you're worried about is swap, look at how fast the SSDs are in these. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I get it. Yeah. And of course, yeah, I mean, having swap problems with a rotational drive is much different different from swap on an SSD. So I'm with you. But again, uh, my next machine, I'd be more comfortable with getting 16 just because, you know, how how, other than it emptying my wallet a bit faster than (laughs) getting eight, um, I'm willing to spend the extra couple hundred bucks to get more RAM. I get it. No, I don't think I get 32 because that's crazy uh, unless you're like, uh, as you pointed out, like a superpower user and, and you're doing like a lot of video or. No, I have know. I have 32 in this machine in front of me here. The 2014 really? iMac. Uh huh. And I've got well, I don't 40. Think I've ever had 32. I've got wow. 40 in the machine downstairs. Uh, the new 2019. Wow, you're a madman. Well, I didn't, I didn't know these things about you. Rams Rams <laughs> relatively cheap. I got both. I, I got that machine downstairs with eight gigs of RAM because I was able to get it that way from the refurb store, which was awesome. Eight gigs of RAM, one terabyte drive. Like this is good uh, because Rams way cheaper to buy from third parties. And so I did. And I, I put uh, two 16 gig sticks in, which means I have, you know, 16 plus 16 plus eight. So 40. There you go. Unless I'm, I think my math still works. So yeah, uh, it, it's fine. I mean, did I notice any issues when that machine was on eight for a couple of days? No, it was fine. Which also, which is the thing that started making me think eh, maybe eight actually is enough. And uh, it, it is, it's fine. But, but again, I don't fault you for like, is 40 way too much for me? Yeah. Oh, dude way too much but it was relatively cheap i mean i think it cost me like 100 bucks or something to to put 40 in there i was like yeah it's fine mm. now i won't have to think about it no and, i get it it's just I, I used to work with graphic artists and advise them on on their mac purchases very and, different uh, you would those right. people need super graphics cards and lots of memory because there's lots of stuff happening when you're doing you know Right. Heavy movie or graphics work. Well, and you um, wouldn't recommend just emailing one, of, and st- mm-hmm. one of these machines for one of those people, regardless of RAM. Right. You, this is not the, you know, the, the a sub fifteen hundred dollar MacBook uh, Air or MacBook Pro is not the computer for those people, even if it had, you know, 64 gigs of RAM. It's just not the, not for what I'd call heavy lifting. Right. Maybe. I mean, you can certainly do work on the road. Absolutely. A, oh, no. These machines are th- these are great machines. They really, really are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've uh, piqued my interest in good. that. Even though I think I want to think I need a pro, <laughs> the Air, I mean, since they've upgraded it and it doesn't have a totally wimpy processor, right? Like 1.4 gig or uh, this MacBook the, the pro early has Airs a had a pretty. Gig. 
No, but I think the early MacBook Airs had pretty wimpy processors, and that was a concern to me. But I, I, I don't think that's the case anymore. Yeah, this is a the one in the in the Pro here is a 1.4 gigahertz quad core i5. So I mean, definitely wimpy uh, if you look at numbers, but but in terms of how it actually performs, not wimpy. Totally great. <laughs> it's no problem. Um, like I said, the only time that I have fan spin up is when core audio is running, but that has nothing to do with uh, taxing the CPU. It's that Mac OS puts the processor in turbo boost mode when core audio is running. Right. And right. so I could be at 8% CPU usage, but the CPU is running not at 1.4, but at, you know, 3.2 or something, whatever it, you know, maxes out at. And that causes it to heat up and then the fans cook. But yeah, the, um, the MacBook Pro, sorry, the MacBook Air, I don't have it in front of me. I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. It has a 1.6 gigahertz dual core i5 is what is what's in there. It would oh, not. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Hmm. I know. It's great. It's a, it's a great machine. So um, there's another thing I want to, I know this, this show is like action packed here, but I've been messing <laughs> with personal automation, John, on iOS. What What is that? I, I've never heard of such a thing. Yeah. So iOS 13.1, you know, I'm a big fan of the shortcuts app, right? Uh, where it, which used to be called workflow. Uh, but, but what it, so there's workflow and you can create uh, various little workflows that can happen, you know, when you trigger them or whatever. Uh, it's always, or for a while now, it's had automation for your home. If you have home kit uh, capabilities, and you can have it like I can, you know, at sunset, I can have it turn on lights and, you know, whatever. If the motion's detected in the driveway, I can have it do other things like there's those home automations, which has been great. And now with iOS 13.1, we get personal automations, which means, John, that I did things like when I arrive at my address, uh, turn on the Wi-Fi on my phone. Because a lot of times when I'm out, I'll turn the Wi-Fi off and then I'll get home and realize, oh, crap, my Wi-Fi is still off and it hasn't automatically turned on again. No problem. When I get home, this automation runs because it geofences. It knows where I'm going to be or it knows where I am. And boom, it turns the Wi-Fi on. OK, so where where is this automation store? It's in, it's in the shortcuts app. Um, and if you don't have that, I don't think it's installed by default. I think you have yeah, to I download think it. Is. it. Okay. I see it, but I, I've, yeah. I haven't done much with it, but I, I probably should. I mean, I remember when we went to Mac stock, there was actually some talks about it. And it was like, oh, wow, yeah, that's cool. Awesome. You can do that sort of I, thing. I have, like, yeah, um, I think I remember one of the presenters actually showed a workflow saying, okay, here's a workflow showing how you can estimate the amount of time for me to get from here to there. Yeah. And I thought that was just like totally cool. I'm like, oh, yeah. wow, I should look at this stuff. More no, it's, it's I'm, awesome. I have, um, I also have my, my uh, CarPlay, uh, I have I use CarPlay as a trigger, so I have it. I have uh, two workflows: one when CarPlay is connected, and one when it's disconnected. And I do a variety of things that are specific to my car, but I also turn the Wi-Fi off when uh, CarPlay is connected because the last thing I want when I'm at an intersection, stopped in the middle of some city somewhere, is my car trying to connect to the, you know, Xfinity Wi-Fi that it's seeing or whatever. It's like, nope, turn Wi-Fi off when car right. plays connected. And so then is the workflow, uh, so is it stored? Uh, so number one, is it dependent on home, home kit? And number two, no. where is it stored? Okay. It's on device. These are on device. They are called personal okay. automations. Yep. And it just Okay. So they're stored on your iPhone or iPad or correct. Or, or, and they are you, they are unique to the device. So if I wanted to do the same CarPlay okay. workflow on my iPad, which would be I wouldn't uh, because I don't use my iPad that way. I don't even know if it would work that way. I don't even I don't know. It's interesting. Maybe I should try. Uh, I you know I would I would have to you know essentially write that that automation over there. But it's super easy. You just go into um, shortcuts. The automation tab is in the middle. You go to automation, and in the upper right is the plus button. And when you go to create a new automation, as long as you have 13.1 or later, you can choose create personal automation and then you can set all kinds of different things. And listener Andy has a cool thing to add because he said uh, with the new personal automations, uh, 
you can choose a trigger for personal automations based on things like events or phone locations or car play. Or if you're connected to a certain Bluetooth device, do certain things, which is cool. One thing I would like to be able to do is launch an app because my radar detector has an app. And I want a personal automation that says when you're connected to the radar detector, launch the app because it doesn't always launch in the background and it doesn't get the data it wants. But I can't. And I that bothers me back to Andy. Uh, Andy says the one in particular I found interesting was called NFC tag. For the first time, he says, I think Apple has opened up the NFC capability of the device in a really useful way. This allows you to scan an NFC tag or sticker which you can easily find for purchase for cheap on Amazon and then define actions to undertake when the phone comes in contact with the sticker. Some of the things I am using it for is to, I put an NFC st sticker on the bedside table. And when I put the phone on the sticker, it turns off the lights. When I'm going to bed, I put a hmm. sticker. He says outside my garage. And when I tap my phone to the sticker, it opens my garage door he says the options are pretty endless and hope people people find it useful. I'm definitely going to get a pack of these NFC stickers and start messing around with it. What a great thing. Yeah, I like it. This is good. This is I've exciting seen that. Me. Yeah. And the thing is, I think, you know, Apple's not always the first, but I, I believe Android has had this ability for a for a while. Yep. Um, they had they had Apple. It was last year with the 10S, the 10S Max and the 10R that the NFC reader was on all the time, but with oh, iOS okay. 12, if you woke up your phone, you could have it read an NFC tag. So they did begin this process of sort of opening up NFC on your phone um, a year ago. But now that they've added it to shortcuts like that is pretty cool because now it used to be like you would have to program a URL into the tag. I think that was the only thing you could do. And so, but, you know, URLs can be used to launch apps and do different. Th Wait a minute. URLs can be used to launch apps. Wait a minute. That what? might be the answer for my radar detector thing, because if I mm -hmm. connect to Bluetooth and I use a URL to launch the radar detector app, my problems might be solved. OK, I have to podcast to finish first, but um, nice. I, I like this, though, because uh, it, it's similar to the QR code stuff yes. that you have now in the camera app. Yes. In that it's like, well, it's a QR code. So read it and like deal with it. And right. so now they're adding that feature for NFC, which is nice because I don't know well, about not, you. Not it, read every, it and deal with it. Like it, a year ago, we could read it and do like like exactly what we're doing with QR codes. Right. Where if there's a URL in there and you could bake a URL into the. Mm -hmm. The, an NFC tag. So like there was a conference I was at where NFC tags had the Wi-Fi information. And you, if you just tapped the, your phone on the tag, they had a URL that would say, here's the Wi-Fi. And, and that was actually handy. But now it's beyond the URL, right? It doesn't have to, the data isn't in the tag. The data is in your phone. So it, it, for, for clarity, the prior way, prior to iOS 13.1, the tag had to have all of the data necessary and anyone who tapped the tag would get whatever the data was. That's fine if it's Wi-Fi and you want that. That's not fine if you have a sticker outside your garage. With what Apple's done in 13.1, the tag is merely the trigger. Your phone is the thing that's acting and, and running a script because it encountered that trigger. So that the tag doesn't have any data to open your garage. The tag is just a trigger. And you tell your phone when you encounter this trigger, you open the garage. So it's a little bit different, which is good. I mean, it, it's secure, which is cool. OK, I got So it's just like a, a GUID or something. So it's just a un, unique ID that exactly. you then tie to something else. Yep. OK. Yep. Whereas the QR code actually has the data embedded within it. And then you got to say yes or no, which, you know. Oh, wait a okay. minute. I'm an, cool. I'm an idiot here, by the way, folks, in what? case, in case all of you didn't know. Um, so I, I started thinking about this cause I, you know, even though I'm doing a podcast, so I went into my, uh, CarPlay, CarPlay connected trigger. Right. And I thought, can I add a URL to launch an app? And so I hit the plus button to add a, a, a step to my automation and I realized that there's an option called scripting. And I'm like, right, scripting is where I would go to do a URL. What's the first option available in scripting? It is open app. 
And so <laughs> I can choose open app. I can find my radar detector app and I choose that. And my problems folks are now solved. <sighs> wow. You just uh, helped I, yourself. That's one of my that's new great. five things. I'm so excited now. This is great. Like a superpower, man. I, I feel super powerful. <laughs> Oh man! Uh, I don't, right. You know what? Back on, I don't know that we can. I don't know that we can top that. So I think this is where I think this is where we need to uh, to wrap things up here. I think I think this is it to uh, get the uh, the hook. We get uh, yeah. I, the I need the hook. Yeah, exactly. Clearly, I need the hook. Where did that come from? I always the thought gong, it was hilarious. The gong show, but it was, right? Wasn't the hook from the Gong Show? I think it. I think that the the hook predates that. Come on, there's shows really? you've seen where. By the Gong right? Show. Right. I mean, pulling somebody off the stage, though. Though the Gong Show was was brilliant. Oh, you might be right. Maybe it was from like vaudeville. Yes. Yes, you I do believe be right that. Yeah, that. acts that weren't going well, they would get the big hook and uh, pull yeah. people off the stage because, uh, you know, otherwise people start throwing produce and fruit and. You know, all sorts of things at you. Who wants that? Now, I have also heard, I don't know if this is true, but I'm glad we, we ended earlier than we could have so that we have a little extra time. Uh, here we go. Hold on. That's fine. Uh, we got another emergency. Going yeah. on so the, the phrase break a leg, there are many different accepted. That's argued, a horrible thing to say no, to no, somebody. No. I yep. mean, that, that's painful. But that phrase means a lot of different things to different people. And and, they, and if you ask anyone involved in like, you know, any sort of performance or theater, they will give you what they believe to be the reason for that phrase. And I have heard one uh, explanation is that what you want to do is get uh, an applause so that you have to bow. And when a woman curtsies, she breaks the form of her leg. It's no longer straight. It's bent. And so break a leg was that. Another one, and I I like this one. I don't. I honestly, I think I don't. I don't know that there's any definitive answer on this. But one that I like is that the um, the sides, the curtains that hold that that like define the size of the stage, are called the legs. Uh, they're also called like well, the wings are what are beyond those curtains, but the curtains are legs. And in vaudeville, you hoped that you would be chosen to go on stage because if you were chosen to go on stage, you got paid for that performance. If you were not chosen, you would not get paid. And in some scenarios, of course, I'm sure there were you know different ways. But if you were chosen to go on stage, then you would be breaking through the legs, the curtains from the, the wings and being able to go on stage. So that break a leg means I hope you get to perform today. So... I like Not that, that I wish painful injury upon you. No. Okay, which right. is what most people would assume when you well, hear and then that there's term. The, it's like, why, why would you well, say that? Well, the, there's me? the other, the, right, the interpretation that follows sort of the more literal, you know, breaking of, of a bone is I'm going to wish you bad luck so that, because if I wish you good luck, bad things might happen. So let me wish <laughs> you bad luck so that good things happen. No, that's the, that's perhaps the most commonly accepted, uh, you know, interpretation of that. But I like the other ones, so... Um, yeah, you know, well, but, and, and, and it may well be the good luck thing because that, like, there are a lot of superstitions. Like you do not say the, uh, M, uh, the, 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 the Scottish play that, that begins with M. That's right. Yeah. No, no. What? No, no. What is that? You don't say Macbeth in a theater, man. <laughs> it's no bueno. Oh, well, the, there was like death and destruction, right? Yeah. No, it's a, it's it's known to be cursed. Like any time um, the the play is is perf not any time, but many times the play was performed. Like people would, there would be problems, and people would. Oh, die okay. So it's a, a cursed. Uh, it's a cursed play. All right. Yeah, it's cur it's just cursed. Yeah, I'll put a link to uh, to the Wikipedia section on uh, on the Scottish curse, and we'll uh, we'll go from. Oh, there. nice. Uh, yeah. All right. No. So we've we've already told you how to contact us via email. I you know I I we have. Um, I want to take what else we got. Yeah, I want to thank all of our premium contributors whose contributions came in over the last oh week. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, you know you can you have you actually have three options. You can contribute a one-time payment. Uh, you can 
contribute on a monthly basis uh, from $10 a month and up if you choose. And you can contribute on a biannual basis if you want to schedule uh, that way. And that's $25 every six months or up. So on the one times, we want to thank for 25, two, uh, two folks with $25 one-time payments, Kurt from Portland and Leslie from New Haven, and one $50 one-time, Ken from Gilroy. So thanks to all of you. On the monthly payments, I want to thank Frederick from Nashville, Gary from Babylon, Anthony from San Francisco, Robert from Clearwater, Stephen from Costa Mesa, Joan from Sarasota, Everett from Marina, Olga from Bellevue, Jason from Charlestown, Stephen from Plainfield, Luann from Albuquerque, Ward from Mesa, Kenneth from New Lambton, Paul from Fishers, Mark from Milford, Nick from Mount Clemens, Stephen from Dromore, and Neil from West Hartford, and... On the biannual $25 every six month plan, I want to thank Andrew from Edinburgh, Michelle from Quebec, Craig from Pace, Chris from Windsor, Mike from Silver Spring, Ulysses from Brooklyn, Keith from Edmonds, Jonathan from Woodside, Ralph from Bangor, Paul from Pomona, Ken L from who knows where, David from Troutdale, Chris from Nailsworth, Lawrence from Stanford with $50 every six months, Kurt from Tawanda, Lewis from Novato, and Robert from Westford. Thanks to all of you. You rock. Fun stuff. Uh, John, what else? Do you, do you have something, someone, something, somehow you wanted to, uh, Any anything? Did I miss something? No. Okay. Um, other than, well, no, I, I believe I was talking about ways to contact us. Yes. And there are several ways. We mentioned the email, but... It's always worth mentioning because Twitter is such a fun place. But I am John Efron. He is Dave Hamilton. The podcast is Mac Gab. The publication is Mac Observer. And Pilot Pete, if you want to reach out to him, because yeah. he's driving the engines of commerce or, he is, or something like he, that. Or he, gained, he gained like, you know, thousands of new followers because of The Bachelorette. Oh. There, there was a guy named Pilot Pete on The Bachelorette. And uh, and they many people thought it was him. It was, maybe it was. Well, or maybe it wasn't. Uh, I don't you know, know, he's a good looking guy. So, you know, I don't blame people, but he's already married and, and stuff. So, you know, I don't know. I don't think that was him on The Bachelorette. I was, there were many no, no, Mac no. Geek Gab episodes prepared uh, from my MacBook Air in my living room while my wife and daughter watched The Bachelorette this summer. So, uh, it was a nice way for me to be present with the family without, um, you know, detaching to do work. But they were engrossed in The Bachelorette and I kept up with enough. You, it, listen, you can do a lot of work and still know everything that's going on far more than you want to know is going on with The Bachelorette, including knowing that that I, pilot I Pete is different from this pilot Pete. Oh, and I don't know. It gets scandalous, John. Maybe you maybe you do. Right. I, I still think our Pete is still quite the catch he so, is um. that's right that's right <laughs> all right so thank you for listening folks thanks for sending in all your stuff um i am not sure when the next episode will release because of my travel schedule it will be some point next week but it might be wednesday let's say it'll be by wednesday so if if you're not hearing from us that don't fret we're we're on it we're just a little bit delayed so Thanks to all of you. Thanks for everything. Sign up for the newsletter at MacGeekGab.com. Thank all of our sponsors by visiting their URLs, TextExpander.com slash podcast, Eero.com slash, that was a loud noise, Eero.com slash MGG, Captera.com slash MGG, ExpressVPN.com slash MGG. Visit MacGeekGab.com slash sponsors if you just want to find it. It's easy, right there. Whatever you choose to do, do it well, and please, please make sure that you don't get caught. Made up.